So my name is John Pistol. I'm the president here at Anderson University. It's my joy and privilege to welcome each and every one of you here to campus to Reardon Auditorium. And um, this is a facility that was built decades ago with a lot of investments from Anderson folks. A lot of, uh, in fact, I have a brother-in-law who is in his, you know, a little bit older than some of us, uh, who GM executive for a number of years, and he was telling me about how uh, the, his bosses uh, encouraged him to contribute to the building of this facility because it could be used for uh, community purposes. So that's our joy to, to welcome here tonight. I'm just curious if this is your first time here at Rudin Auditorium to show hands. Some of you? Yeah. Well, welcome. So the main campus, of course, just across the street, and, and the sports facilities and everything over there. Uh, I'm intrigued by this because I grew up a block from campus here, and then uh, went to school here, my dad taught here, and then went off to Indianapolis to law school, came back to town, practiced a couple of years, and just didn't enjoy it, and so I joined uh, the federal government, and for, for the next 31 years, I worked in downtown urban areas, including Minneapolis, New York, D.C. on a couple of occasions, lived in both Virginia and Maryland on different assignments. Um, Boston, lived outside of Boston because couldn't afford to live in the city. So for 31 plus years, I commuted. Uh, so I, I got a sense of transportation challenges and opportunities and thinking, boy, if I was in charge, I would do some different planning and different things. Um, and so coming back to Anderson, coming home five years ago now, uh, one of the joys is they provide a house here on campus on the other side here, and so my commute is about 10 minutes round trip, and that's walking both ways as opposed to about an hour and a half round trip on, on average that, that I spend. And what's intriguing and satisfying about what you are working on is thinking about planning for Madison County transportation needs for the next 25 years. And the importance of doing that, because in my years of commuting, as I mentioned, my sense was, and my question was, did anybody do any planning around this, or did urban sprawl just happen and people reacted to it? So as we see the 69 North Corridor continuing to grow past 210 and 13 and coming up, and of course we have a presence out of two, exit 222 um, with the, our Anderson University Flagship Center and, and coordination with the Flagship Enterprise Center with Dr. Terry Truitt, the Chief Executive is over here, former Dean of our School of uh, Business, Fall School of Business. We look for ways that we can help make a difference because, for example, the, the students who are enrolled here, particularly the undergrad students, these, these are the Gen Zers that we are hoping will, uh, not hoping to graduate for one thing, but then also hoping that they will stay local. And so one of the things that you may have seen something we're doing is a scholarship initiative to keep local talent local. And some of you are have served or do serve on either the South Madison County Community Foundation or I'm on the board of the, the Madison County Foundation. And thing, things that entities like that can do to help underwrite scholarships to keep local talent local. So we're seeing a lot of interest in those scholarships because it makes it uh, the, the cost of a uh, a four-year degree much more accessible even to the point of being comparable to that of a, of a public school. So we're excited by that. Um, hopefully some of you saw an initiative we had a week ago Saturday, halftime of our um, final men's basketball game where we drew names from a hat for those students who had applied, high school students applied and admitted and made a deposit to attend here in the fall. And the person who was drawn was allowed to shoot a half-court shot. Did anybody see that? Yeah, so we, we've had a lot of views. It's, uh, and if you saw it, you know that this student from Alexandria High School hit the shot, which we had said that you're, you'll get a year's free tuition uh, if you hit the shot. Somebody asked us, well, did you buy an insurance policy against that? And we talked to our broker ahead of time. He said, I'm glad to take your premium. Uh, but the odds of somebody actually getting the shot are negligible. So, you know, but you go ahead and give me the premium and all that. Well, so we didn't. But the good news is um, a friend who is a friend of the university, which is euphemism for a donor, uh, contacted me over the weekend and said that he is making a contribution to cover the cost of that. 
So that's part of that partnership. And that's what you guys are all about, is looking for opportunities to be in partnership to inform the future for this next generation of, of people who hopefully will, will be here and see you. So with that, again, welcome. Let me now turn it over to Kyle May, who will guide you through the program. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, President Pistol. Thank you for this. And thank you for having us in the wonderful facility. It's great to be back in Anderson, as the President points out. My name is Kyle May. I'm a senior planner with uh, Planning Next. We're a community planning firm based in Columbus, Ohio. We've been helping uh, your community navigate what is a very complicated process, a metropolitan transportation plan. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on, and we're going to talk a little bit about, more about why your role in this process is so critical. But a couple of things in, uh, from the President's remarks I, I thought were quite interesting as they relate to what we're talking about. Number one, I think you need to move the shot back. That will help you a little bit more. <laughs> Full court might be a little harder. Uh, number two, um, I, I love the, the note you, you, you start this about this idea of you know experiencing this transportation infrastructure the notion of, I wish I was in charge I would make different decisions well the way we do planning today you've become a lot more in charge and this meeting today and the meetings that we've had leading up to this are a demonstration of that um, you all experience this system uh, you contribute to it and tonight's uh, events and questions and conversation are really all about continuing this planning process and bringing you those people that experience the system, invest in the system, into a planning process that's going to, that's going to help move that system forward in what we believe is a, is a very progressive uh, way. So we're really, we, uh, I say we, myself and Logan Stang from our office, are, are very excited to be here with you uh, tonight. We've got a lot of, of big questions to ask. We've got a great presentation put together for you. But ultimately, tonight's agenda is about a little bit of presentation, but also a lot of discussion along with all of you. Some, review of the work we've done so far, but some discussion around the really big questions that have started to emerge from this pretty complicated process about how do we move people and goods more efficiently around your community and indeed around your region. So thank you again to Anderson University for this wonderful space. Uh, thank you again for, for being a, uh, an, uh, a, 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 a one of those things that's so critical in terms of the lifeblood of your community, which is generating more and more talented young people. We have these conversations around the country. The key thing you know, that we bring into this is how do we retain and grow talent in place and make sure that that talent, once it is trained, really is in love with the community that trained it, right? And really wants to stay and continue to invest in that place. So as we launch our meeting tonight, as you saw in, in a lot of the promotion, Destination 2045 is pretty high-minded. Uh, we think this is a pretty you know, important moment for the communities of, of the Madison County region. Uh, there's a lot going on, and Brian Phelps from, from the uh, MCOG is gonna talk a lot more about that as his game client. There's a lot going on in the community and in the, in the world indeed that make now a really important time to be doing planning in general, but very specifically transportation planning. These guys are gonna tell you a whole lot more about that in specifics, but I'm excited for you because you're doing this work really at the right time. And when you do this work, this, this, this transportation planning, this mobility conversation, it's not just about transportation, right? It's about community investments. It's about land use. It's about growth, development, those questions. But it's also about quality of life, quality of place, and indeed, quality of opportunity for young people, for people of all ages, uh, better access to, to opportunities, better access um, to lifestyle amenities and all those sorts of things. So we're excited to be involved in this process and also that you're doing this work right now. Our agenda tonight is ambitious, so I'm going to do my best, which I've never been quite good at, as being very brief. I'm going to be very brief in the welcome here and in the process because I want to get to the substance and I especially want to get to that discussion. We want to talk about the state of your region, where you are today, where you could be tomorrow without intervention, and where you might be tomorrow with some progressive action on your part. We want to also have a great keynote presentation from our invitee here, Gabe Klein, national expert on these issues we're gonna be talking about. Very excited to have him in the room. But as you see, a major part of tonight is about this discussion, testing some direction statements, testing a vision, testing some specifics from the work that these guys have done, and having some conversations at the tables. So for those of you that are a little lonely right now in terms of your get together, we may ask you to to find some partners a little bit later on, but I won't do that now, table two. I'll let, let it ride just a little bit longer, okay? 
We're excited you're here. There's a word, a big word that we're going to use a lot tonight that we wanted to define right from the offset because it's just so critical to our conversation. It's this word, mobility. We used to just say transportation, but mobility is a little more encompassing of the work that these guys are trying to do. What is mobility? It's the way you get around your neighborhood, right? It's, it's how and where you commute. It's how we move goods from A to B. Gabe's going to get into this in a lot more depth and in a lot broader focus, but basically mobility is how far you or your children can get on a bike. It's how far you can walk from your hometown. It's how free you are, the ability to move or be moved freely and easily around your community or indeed around the region. This word is important. It's a massive word. It's a big word. It's packed with a lot of things, but it's the focus of our process and our planning effort. Some housekeeping. Restrooms, pretty easy. Uh, women's and men's, to the right and to the left. Wi-Fi is going to be important in tonight's uh, presentation as we get to, we're going to have some smartphone polling. You don't have to be on the Wi-Fi to participate in this, but it might be a little bit quicker. So you've got some guides actually on your station that can show you how to get into that. You see those little table tents. They're going to show you how to connect. It's Raven's Guest. It couldn't be easier. You're just going to click and get connected. So that's going to be this thing right in the center if you'd like to connect. Uh, paperwork, don't forget that sign-in sheet that's going to be in green in the center. If you'd like to be, stay involved in the process, get some updates, just let us know you were here. We'd really appreciate that. Volunteer as much or as little information as you'd like. Uh, table leaders, you don't have to determine that now, but if you've got an itch to really lead your table through this discussion today, start thinking about volunteering for that. Okay, I see some folks that are already good, eligible people in that realm. And if you need help, we've got lots of help. Blue shirts, raise your hands everywhere around the room. We've got some great folks from MCOG here to help out. We've got Logan in the corner from my office. And from our stakeholder committee, because we've had great leadership throughout this process. If you're a member of the stakeholder committee, could you also raise your hand, please? Don't be shy. There we go. We've got some great representation from our group as well. So they're here to help. They're here to help on anything, whether it's about Wi-Fi. You may want to check with the blue shirts on that, or if it's more specifically about our program. So again, we believe this is a pivotal moment. It's not just about you know, the, the plan we're putting together, but it's the opportunity of that plan. There's real money that's tied to this work. And usually when you do planning, it, it's, it's about, okay, now how do we fund all these great ideas we have? In the case of the MTP and doing this at a regional level, there's my first acronym of the night. I'm sorry, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. These guys do a lot of acronyms, okay? The letters thing. We try to define those in your agenda. So on the third page, you're going to see all those terms defined, but I'm going to try my best not to do them. But this is exciting because when we get done with this process, there's some real funding opportunities for each of these projects. It can be updated throughout the work, and they can be updated through this plan and even into the, excuse me, into the future. And we believe that this type of planning is, is really a proactive approach. It allows you to put your head up, look at your challenges and opportunities, and try to be strategic about your investments, not just with transportation and mobility, but about economic development, about land use, growth, housing. You can tie all these things together and really make a big impact in your community. And as these guys are really going to tell you, now is a great time to think big, think regionally. And an MTP, there we go again, a Metropolitan Transportation Plan is a requirement under federal law, but it's, it's really at the highest level, it's this guide of how do we invest in our transportation system. It goes from things like sidewalks all the way up to interstate interchanges and regional transit. All these things are encompassed in this very, very broad and large and ambitious process. But it is mandated for metropolitan planning organizations. And Ryan can tell you, will tell you a whole lot more about that. But it helps us guide, as a community, guide how we invest in that infrastructure. We all, as Americans, have built a significant amount of infrastructure over the last 10 years, 20 years, and especially 50 years. We can't fix it all overnight. We can't address all the congestion issues overnight. We have to prioritize. And through planning processes like this, we're able to do that. And not just do it alone in a room with it shut, but rather in conversations just like this, which is a new addition to this type of work. You know, it is part of what we're doing tonight is really not beginning a conversation, but continuing one. I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, which is great, that have been involved in some of our earlier conversations on this topic. We have over 100 participants that have contributed their time, their ideas to our first round of engagement through intercept activities and online forums. We also had a series of focus groups, so I see some of those faces as well. We got more detailed because a lot of this stuff gets really detailed really quick. It's about you know, moving freight through your community, those issues. It's about the public safety and how they interact with that network, the pedestrian, the bicycle network, cyclists, those sorts of things. 
All those interests are really critically important, and we've tried hard to engage them through round one. And some ideas that have come out of these, I'm not going to put numbers to them because they're really, they, they really do range, but you know, these, these conversations have been interesting because they, the, the feedback we've gotten is one, been really resonant. There's a lot of things that people are concerned about, but two, it's been also quite wide ranging. But one thing at the center, and it's at the center of these dots on purpose, is that people, people should really be at the center of this decision making process. Meaning that as we evaluate projects, it's the impact of people's lives, their quality of life, their quality of place, that's really, really critical here. It's not just about the necessarily just the efficiency of the network, but it's also about the impact of people and people's lives. Movement of people and goods, where do people want to live? This lifestyle question has been important, and Brian will dig into that a little bit more when he talks about population. But ultimately, we've had a lot of discussions already, and what we're here to do tonight is really to test the direction. So the work we've done so far, everything we've heard up until this point, tonight we want to test to see if we're close, if we're heading on the right path, and if so, great, this is going to be wind in our sails. If we need to pivot, that's fine too, but we need to know along with you if we're headed down the right path, because we intend to come back to you, maybe in a little bit of a different forum, but come back to you through the regional expedition and um, uh, exhibition and review, prioritize, and really launch the plan um, into the future. So we're excited for this middle piece, this primary piece of our engagement work, but I also want to let you know that we're not done with that. So why are we here tonight? Our purpose with Destination 2045 is to do a few things. One, it's to share what you told us. We did a little bit of that already, but to share all the variety of ideas that you told us, whether it was about freight, whether it was about transit, whether it was about the cycling network. We're also here to think about some new ideas. So we're not done generating ideas. So we want you to think hard, think critically about your experience using the network, your experience of where you live, and what you think could be done to improve this place over time. We want to test our direction, and I went on, uh, I talked a little bit about that already. And last, tonight, we really want to start to build something together. That Metropolitan Transportation Plan, while it's federally mandated, and it's got a lot of checklists and requirements, it can also be a lot of what you want it to be, right? And it should be defined about everybody's priorities in this room and the folks that are connected to you outside of this room. So we really want to start to build that thing here tonight. What it's going to look like, what it's going to inspire, and what it eventually is going to deliver for you in terms of an improved place and an improved transportation network. But you also made a choice to be here and a choice that we really, really do appreciate. Uh, you care about the future of your community. That's quite obvious, or you wouldn't give up a couple hours on a Wednesday night to be here to talk about it. You also have ideas. I know that because a lot of you have told me them already. Uh, this plan requires your input, um, and I, I mean requires your input not just to be written, but to be implemented. This needs to be supported by the people that are here and the people that you're connected to as well. And it, there's a bottom point here that I think is really quite interesting. It's also quite new in metropolitan planning like this, is that you really have the opportunity to be participants in the implementation of this work. It's not that just Ryan and his team and the communities they're connected with take this plan and go do it, but there's opportunities to, to be advocates in this work. There's opportunities to champion some of these projects. There may be an opportunity to build out some of these programs uh, that are suggested through this work. Um, so we hope that you take that seriously and see yourself reflected in one or hopefully multiple of these actions uh, moving forward. Our activities tonight, it's not just going to be about talking, we've got a number of those. I'm going to set those up a little bit later, but we want to test the regional vision, of course. We want to consider some reactions that you might have to some of our fundamental building blocks of the plan. We want to identify really what's missing, because we're not, we know that there's going to be blind spots in this work. We've been working hard to involve a lot of people, but surely there's some things that we've missed, so we want you to tell us that. And then last, we want to tell you what's next and how you can stay involved and actually how you can also help to connect more people into this specific conversation through online forums, which will be live after tonight as well. But with that said, I think what we needed to do now is set up a little bit of the state of, of your region today. So where is this region right now in terms of its demographics, its economics, or its place-based phenomena? So in order to do that, I'm going to bring up Ryan Phelps. He's the project manager here with the Madison County Council of Governments. He's going to walk you through some of the finer points of where you all are today. Thank you, Kyle, and uh, thank you, everybody else uh, who's in attendance tonight. Um, so I want to try to keep my comments fairly brief. I'm standing between you and a much better speaker and getting Klein. Uh, 
I also want to say just a quick thank you to our team. So I'm really presenting a lot of the work that our team has been doing lately, um, just generally looking at the region. Uh, and I want to recap real quick what our region is. Uh, so we're all of Madison County, plus the towns of Taylorville and Fort Bill. Uh, we plan for a population of 139,000, just over that. Uh, and we have kind of two different areas that we really look at. Uh, we have our, our MPA, or Metropolitan Planning Area, uh, which is roughly 471 square miles, and then the third, uh, a third of that is our urbanized area. That's uh, really the core of the area that we look at uh, for our funding. Uh, so that's everywhere from Alexandria down to Fort Bill, uh, kind of along that State Road 9, uh, US 36 corridor. Uh, and, and when we really look at this region, we've kind of identified three subregions um, set within that that really face some drastically different issues. Um, and, and I'll reference these kind of as I get into the, the regional trends. Uh, but we break these out into the, the northern region, so that's uh, northern Madison County, Elwood, Alexandria, Franklin, Summitville. Um, it's a little bit more rural, uh, and, and it comes along with some different issues um, from a rural aspect. Central and East, that's what we consider uh, Anderson, Chesterfield, Daleville, and Markleville. Um, that's really a lot more of an urban uh, type of setting, so it, it deals with very different issues from, from the northern subregion. Uh, and finally, we break out the southwest subregion, that's Pendleton, Fort Bill, Lapel, and Angles, um, really on the suburban fringe of, of the, the Indianapolis metro region, and, and they're facing some significantly different issues. So we really have a, a very interesting region um, with this cross section of three very unique subregions, um, and, and it has an impact within every level that we, that we look at. Uh, so, four key findings that I really want to be presenting on tonight, uh, shifting population, evolving employment, uh, system safety, and disruptive trends. These are four areas that have kind of really popped out in our early discussions and some of our initial analysis that I wanted to make sure to highlight just to kind of set the stage for, for our region. Um, so the first one is the shifting population. Uh, so between 2000 and 2015, the region lost 2.2% of the population. Uh, despite the fact that the Southwest subregion gained 17% of, of its population, or increased its population by 17%. So that really, really helps to illustrate the difference in, in growth and where exactly it's occurring. So the Southwest subregion is seeing a lot of sprawl from Indianapolis, a lot of uh, continued push of growth, uh, whereas the, the North and Central East subregions are really seeing a more significant decline and it's offsetting that, that amount of growth. Uh, but a lot of it's spurred from the uh, Indianapolis mega region, which is even projected to grow an additional 26% uh, of its population by 2050. Um, and this has drastic implications for the transportation system. So, um, the first one we've highlighted here is reactive land use and infrastructure policies. This is really uh, trying to drill at the point that the communities in our southwest subregion uh, are small towns that don't necessarily have the staff or the policies in place to uh, uh, to, to handle this type of growth. It's too much, it's too fast. And what happens with that is we, we um, end up with some significant issues uh, that, that transfer over into the transportation system. Along with that, we have funding shortages. So those communities can't necessarily fund all of the infrastructure improvements that they need in order to support the new growth. Uh, and then the north and central east subregions, as they're seeing a decline in population, uh, they don't have the funding in place in order to, to support uh, because of the loss of population. Um, and then, then for us, really, that means that we have an issue in trying to balance where does our support need to go. Uh, because even though the Central East is the largest subregion, uh, the Southwest needs a lot of help as well. So um, it's really about identifying how we can balance between those subregions. Uh, the second point that we have is on evolving employment. Uh, so it should come as no surprise to anybody here, but between 2000 and 2015, there was a continuation in the decline of manufacturing jobs. Um, and that, that's really uh, had a huge impact on uh, the transportation system. Uh, in that time, we've also seen a rise of service industries. And this is an important note because those two industries, or industry types, have a very different use of transportation. Uh, and that really goes to the point of the implication of outdated allocation of space. Uh, so we no longer have massive manufacturing buildings that employ 10,000 people on one site and have to have uh, 
three three lane roadways in one direction to support shift working. Um, that's not something that we necessarily need anymore. So our infrastructure is outdated and it's ready to be uh, uh, brought into the 21st century. Um, along with uh, the shifting in, in industries, <clears throat> we have this massive dependence on commuting. Uh, so we have a huge time, about 35% of the workforce leaves uh, Madison County daily. Um, a lot of that's going into Hamilton County and Marion County, but it also varies around um, some of the other uh, counties around us as well. Um, so that really indicates the, the over-dependence that we have on our commuter corridors like I-69, uh, US-36, State Road 13, uh, and those, those areas are going to continue to see issues if we don't uh, address the problem at all. Unfortunately, while widening I-69 is great for now, it's kind of a short-term solution. It's not necessarily uh, going to get us where we need to be uh, long-term. Uh, the third item here that we have is system safety. Um, so we have some good news and some bad news here. The, the good news is that we're decreasing vehicular crashes overall uh, and, and decreasing those rates um, of fatality. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that non-motorized crashes, that's bike ped, those types of crashes are, are increasing, and because of the nature of being a biped or uh, being a pedestrian or on a cycle, bicycle, uh, you're really a vulnerable user. So what we, we call um, that, that group is a vulnerable road user. Uh, so their fatality rates are um, drastically higher than vehicular crashes. Uh, so this has a lot of implications for us as well. We need to make sure that we're providing infrastructure for non-motorized facilities or for non-motorized users. Um, because of the disproportionate risk uh, and, and funding. Uh, and I'm sure that it's not a surprise to anybody to see some of these headlines. These are just some of the headlines that we've seen over the last few years um, here within our region and a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of fatalities and injuries for, for non-motorized users. Uh, the last trend that I wanted to indicate was uh, this, this consideration for disruptive trends. Um, so these are, these are items kind of outside of our region, external from us, um, but they still have a very drastic impact on how we operate and how we um, plan in the future. So things like changing demographics, um, so how we're, we're aging and addressing issues that come along with aging, um, how we're addressing some of these lifestyle cho style choices like Kyle mentioned, um, like decreasing and delaying the uh, driver's license. So, younger generations aren't necessarily going directly for, for the driver's license, and how we still make sure that we're supporting that and making it an attractive community for, for people who don't necessarily have a driver's license. Uh, beyond demographics, uh, there's a lot of technologies that are changing how we see the world. Uh, we want this into transformative technologies. These are things like ride sharing, uh, like Uber and Lyft. Um, and this category goes on, and I'm sure that Gabe's gonna uh, hit some of this in his uh, presentation as well. Um, beyond this, you know, we're looking at driverless cars and how those are going to impact us. We need to be considering these things because our plan is long-range in nature. So these are things that we want to make sure that we're uh, considering for over the next 25 years. Um, uh, the next disruptive trend we have is climate change. This is something that we're just starting to see uh, impacts for and really trying to dive into uh, research for that. Uh, making sure that, that we're building a place that's resilient and it's going to be able to continue to support our communities moving forward. Um, so a lot of this really points to uh, the implication that we have uh, a very uncertain future um, while we're seeing these, these trends more directly. Uh, so population and employment, we can, we can measure those, we can measure safety. Uh, these disruptions are totally shifting how we think about the world and they're, they're leading a leaving us in a place of uncertainty uh, for planning in the future. Uh, uh, so really that just brings up the point, uh, how do we win the future? So how do, we, how do we define this uncertainty? How do we make sure that we know what direction we want to be moving in? And that's really one of the reasons that we're all here tonight. Uh, so we've, we've kind of outlined these four main steps. Uh, we're really trying to wrap up the first two tonight. So right, we want to set a vision for the future. Where is it that we're trying to go? And then establish the objectives, identifying how it is that we're going to get there, what it means to be successful, and get get to the future we're going to get into. Uh, and then within our office, you know, then we then we start testing these policies and projects. Uh, we really see how they line up with the measures that the general public wants to see 
whether or not they're going to help us get to the, the future that we all want to see. Um, and then we continue to evaluate these. The process never really ends. We go back and forth and make sure that we're updating our assumptions, that we're changing our, our uh, policies, or including all of these different uh, disruptive trends uh, moving forward. And that's uh, really all that I have. Uh, Kyle's going to help kick us off over to uh, Gabe. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that. Get a round of applause for Kyle. This team has done a lot of work. Transportation nerds, but that's okay. We all need it. We all need it. Well, guys, we're, we're very excited now. Uh, transition our presentation a little bit to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, uh, Gabe Klein, author of Startup City and many, many other roles that he's had uh, throughout the years. Um, Gabe, former commissioner of Chicago, Washington D.C. DOTs, uh, most recently author of Startup City, inspiring private and public entrepreneurship, getting projects done and having fun. I don't know how you. All those three together, but I, I guess he's going to give us the magic sauce. But, but Gabe is he's truly an expert on, on not just urban design, but transportation. And, you know, how really technology, which is this big, scary cloud out there, can really help improve our lives, improve our experiences, and ultimately improve our access and opportunities. So, without any more delay, I'd like to introduce Gabe Klein to the stage. And thank you so much for being here, Gabe. We tend to think of our streets today 
as places to move as many people as possible, as fast as possible, right? That's why we have fatalities. If you're doing 5, 10, 15 miles an hour, the chance of an injury or fatality is very low. When you're in 50, 60, 70 in an arterial um, and you hit something, it's very high. So what's interesting about this picture is it shows how our, our urban streets used to be used for commerce. This is where people met, uh, where they hung out with their neighbors, um, where they shopped. It was, there was a sense of community in the streets. It was not so much about uh, moving people. Now, fast forward, uh, things changed. We industrialized. Um, Post-war, uh, people came back and we had to put people to work. We put them to work building cars, uh, building highways, building track housing, uh, building suburbs. Um, there's a bit of a, almost like a social re-engineering of our, of our way of life. We had rural and we had urban, and those were very normal. We've had, we've had cities for tens of thousands of years, going back to Syria or Rome, um, but this was all new in, the, in human history, and we've been on the planet for about 200,000 years in some form. Um, but this is about 80 years old. This is all new. We've never done this before. So, um, at first we were just connecting our cities um, through more rural areas. And then we decided, hey, this is working so well, let's just drive the highways right through the cities. And let's just make them places for jobs, not necessarily places to live. And then some people were surprised and people left, which doesn't surprise me. Um, and we moved people, we sort of sold people this idea of the American dream, and they moved to the suburbs. And so these were 750 square foot tract houses. Um, everybody got a car. And um, how many people in this room own a car? Raise your hand. All right, everybody. So the thing about a home in the United States is it's an appreciating asset. Generally, there are downturns. A car is always an appreciating asset, unless you have like a you know, 1965 Corvette, right? So um, that meant a change in the economics uh, of people's lives as well. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges that this way of life has created for us, this way of life that we invented about 75, 80 years ago. So basically, we have a problem where our ecosystem around us over the last 110 years since the Industrial Revolution started um, is basically, our, our, it's creating an a, a ecosystem that's not hospitable to human life. Um, and then we have tension between government and the private sector. I'm a person that's a total capitalist, and I, I'm a startup guy, um, and I work in government. And so it's very interesting for me to see the differences on both sides. But um, the challenge is that companies focus primarily on short-term profits, quarter-quarter profits. Anybody been watching the stock market lately? <laughs> and government focuses on long-term 2045 solutions, and they're not as good at moving fast. So there's inherently a disconnect there when we're trying to move our country or our community or our city forward. So here's some of the impacts of the last 110 years. Um, and by the way, transportation is the number one emitter of CO2 since, since uh, I'm sorry, 2016, for the first time since 1980. That's why transportation is such an important thing right now. So we have to get a, a, a control over our land use, our pollution uh, from vehicles. And some people say, well, hey, all we need is autonomous electric vehicles. And I'll tell you, I own an electric vehicle. The problem is there's more CO2 emitted from building my Tesla than there is from driving a fossil fuel powered vehicle. So it's, you know, it, it's not just um, uh, about uh, driving cleaner vehicles. It's about having fewer vehicles, right? Fewer things that we have to build in factories. And we're seeing real impacts of this day in, day out. Um, and it's hitting, um, not up here probably as much, it's hitting more like the south, the southeast. Uh, Texas is getting hit really hard. Um, but there's a real economic impact. So we hear people say like, well, let's, let's think about it how much money we can make today, we'll deal with that tomorrow. The problem is, that cost is going to be very, very, very high, right? Um, it's like if you eat McDonald's cheeseburgers every single day, 
right? <laughs> you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, eventually you're going to be unhealthy. No offense to anybody that loves McDonald's. I like McDonald's. Um, but the fact is you can't do it all the time. You can't drive all the time either. The other impact we're seeing is a lot of traffic deaths. What's fascinating to me, I'm in Canada quite a bit. Canada's not that much different than we are. I mean, the people are a bit nicer, right? They have Tim Hortons, we got Starbucks. But generally, when you're in Canada, it doesn't feel that much different. Yet they have almost half the deaths per capita that we do on, on the roads. So they're doing something different in the way that they, they design their roads. Um, and the other thing that's interesting, and we have some of the best healthcare in the world, particularly like you know, cancer treatments and stuff, but man, is it expensive. And we spend a lot per person. There's a lot of reasons for that. I'm not going to try to oversimplify it. But the fact that we have a very sedentary lifestyle, we drive everywhere, um, doesn't help. If you look at these other countries and you look at their transportation systems and how much they spend sedentary in cars, it's very different. So there are all these secondary and tertiary impacts of the decisions that we make around the investment in our transportation system. And then, to make it, to, you know, to compound it, it's really hard to fix. Like, these are complicated. You can't just look at transportation in a silo, right? You can't just look at health in a silo. Everything's interrelated. And so it makes it really challenging, particularly when you have a built environment that is built to then change it. So let's not be too hard on ourselves. Um, and that's why we have long-range plans. But there are also things you can do in the short term. So this part is about expanding your mind in terms of what you think is possible. Because look, we all have a frame of reference, right? I mean, I guess the average age in here is maybe 50. Um, and so you know what you've seen for the last 50 years, and you've probably read a little bit, and you've been maybe overseas and seen some things. But the reality is we are sort of victims of our limitations and frame of reference, all of us. So let's talk about what's happening. For one thing, for those of us that are almost 50, like, like myself, Younger people uh, have much less interest in driving everywhere. And so they will move somewhere where they don't have to drive. They have their phone. Their phone will take the place of their car. <laughs> they would rather be sitting in a bar with their friend hanging out and spending money on beer uh, and be on the internet than they would behind the wheel for two hours a day commuting. And they're willing to make less money. Um, the other thing is, you know, college kids coming out of, out of school have on average $100,000 worth of debt. So they can't afford to buy a car anyway if they wanted to. Um, so this is a 2014 number. Many of you have probably taken Ubers and Lyfts. Um, this is before Uber and Lyft really took off. So in, in my hometown of Washington, D.C., 88% um, of people moving to the city are not bringing a car or buying a car. Now it's up above 90%. So there are places where you have really good land use, transportation oriented, development, we call it, where we're building high density, close to transit. We have a lot of options for active transportation, walking, biking, scooters, all kinds of stuff. And, um, and we make it very visible through marketing programs. So people come and visit first, they see all these options and they say, you know what, I'll pay an extra $500 a month and I'll live near the metro and I won't spend $900 a month to have a car. Um, and even with all these cool technologies and all this stuff that's happening, when you talk to younger people, they say, I still want to be close to the transit station, right? Because it's not so much about moving people. Yes, I'll take transit sometimes. It's more about everything that's organized around that transit node. It could be a commuter rail station. It could be a bike share station. But what you'll find is when you locate or co-locate multiple transportation options, all of a sudden, you get more development, you get the restaurant, the bar, the doctor's office, right, the grocery store, and it becomes a community, it becomes a node. Um, but we do have a lot of these new business models, and they're lowering the costs to get around. You can get on a, on a bike share in my hometown for 28 cents a day, unlimited use, right? That's pretty affordable. And when you have these young people coming out of school, um, or older people that want to age in place, um, they are not into the idea of hyperconsumption that we were all into in the 20th century. 
Everybody wanted a couple cars, white picket fence, a swimming pool, all of this stuff. Um, people are more into this idea of sharing things, you know, shared vehicles, shared scooters, um, community. Um, this is a picture from Copenhagen. Some of these pictures I took, some are off the internet, but when I was in Copenhagen a couple years ago, um, which is an amazing place for biking and for transit, not for driving so much. So if you want to buy a car there, right? Um, let's say you want to buy a Toyota Camry. Here would be 30000 There, don't cringe, there would be a $60,000 tax. This would be a $90,000 car. But that $60,000, goes into the transit system. So almost nobody has a car. Because the transit is so amazing. There's trams running down every street. There's bike share everywhere. So when you go to the airport, instead of the big rental car counter, there's these giant screens saying, for 80 kroner a day, whatever that is, I think it's like 10 bucks, you get unlimited access to all the transportation. Not only that, you get unlimited access to the museums, the Tivoli um, amusement park downtown, the bike share system. And then it's not just about making it easy, like frictionless virtually, to use it. But notice how physically you can see where to go. You can bring your bike on the train. I jumped on in Copenhagen, took my bike that I had to uh, Sweden, jumped off and biked to where I needed to go. I was in Amsterdam and Stockholm for two weeks with my family, with two kids, a stroller, and au pair. And uh, we never got in a car the whole time in two weeks. So, this stuff has a real impact on how people move around and how affordable society is for people. Um, we tend to think, by the way, that like, well, we have this road system, we gotta keep investing in it, right? So we're gonna spend the money somehow. It's just a matter of where you spend it. And then depending on where you spend it, you get these externalities like pollution and other things that you gotta pay a lot of money in the back end to clean up. So when I was in Chicago running that DOT, we said, you know what? We're gonna do something really radical. And in our complete streets document, our big planning document, we're gonna say this, that we're putting people first, and we assumed that we're gonna get a lot of backlash, like AAA and others. We got no backlash. Because it's hard to argue with putting people first. You know, for decades we've been putting the car first. And where has it gotten us? 1.24 million deaths per year. Worldwide. So, who knows what the number one killer of young people is in the United States, 10 to 19? Anybody? Car crashes. It's not coronavirus, it's not HIV, it's car crashes. It's a health epidemic. But we take it as the cost of doing business, right? We accept it. So, we said we're going to reorient our streets towards people who want to walk and bike. Um, and so there were simple solutions like this, you know, four lane uh, street, four and a half lane street. We took one lane and made it a two way cycle track. And we used digital technology at the intersections um, to uh, uh, change lights when cyclists were there or when cars were there. Um, we used sensors. And there was actually no impact to the throughput of automobiles. Because the other thing that's a bit of a fallacy that, that, that we think is like, hey, we need to expand the roadway because there's congestion. And first of all, everybody thinks they have congestion and most people don't actually have congestion. But um, when you expand the roadway, it actually only helps on average for two months and then you have more congestion because psychologically you're telling people to drive, right? Um, but the other thing is in an urban environment or, or a town environment where you have a stop sign or, or a, a, a light every block or two, you can't go fast. Right? So it's not about fast, it's about organized throughput. And we don't optimize our signal systems. Instead, we keep building extra capacity. And part of that is that the road builders want to build more roads. It's a stimulus program, but it costs a lot of money. Other things you can do, we had a, very, we had a lot of these unsafe five-way uh, intersections in Chicago, so we made them art projects. And um, uh, through public art, we also uh, sort of hid the engineering that had to be done to make them uh, safer. Um, there was a bit of study that went in, but you can do these in a couple of days uh, in terms of putting them in. Um, so you have other uh, uh, places like Barcelona that are saying, you know what, we've got a, a climate crisis, we've got a fatality crisis, injuries, 
we want to cut 60% of our emissions out, 60% of our um, traffic, and so they came, they came up with this idea for super blocks. So they have these like five by five uh, neighborhood areas, and the, the first step is to say, um, no left turns. So what happens? So when you turn into the neighborhood, you have to turn right back out. Pretty simple. So you can't drive through the neighborhood. Um, and then phase two is you eliminate uh, through traffic completely, unless somebody lives in that area or it's a delivery truck. And at first, really controversial. People are like, I don't want that. That's terrible. It's horrible. By the way, all good ideas are very controversial at first. You may know this. Because we have people that are on average 50, you've probably experienced in those times. This is true. Um, and now, everybody wants super blocks. Once they saw the quality of life, now people are competing to get super blocks and they want to build 500 of them in neighborhoods throughout Barcelona. Because this is what people want. They want livability, they want quality of life, they want to be able to walk to everything. They don't want to spend two, three hours a day in their cars or worrying about their kids getting run over. Um, Who's been to San Francisco? Anybody here? Okay. So Market Street is sort of a famous street in San Francisco. Uh, Ten years ago, I think, they floated the idea of closing it to, to cars. And people were like, that's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Uh, recently, unanimously, uh, the uh, city council voted to close the street to cars. It's been a huge success already. Um, and you have other places like Tucson, um, uh, Phoenix, uh, uh, other places, that I know light rail is controversial here, or streetcars, I know you probably can't build them, but um, you could do BRT. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting transit projects happening around the country with very high returns on investment. Um, so let's talk about how we get where we need to go. Um, for one thing, we have to accept that like, we got to look at something beyond level of service, the idea of just moving as many people as we can as fast as we can through intersections. And that's what typically the State Department of Transportation are focused on. And to be honest, it's a pretty worthless metric. Most of our intersections are failing. And um, so it can be an F plus or an F minus, but it's still failing. However, the outcomes that we're trying to accomplish in terms of making people healthier, uh, making people happier, reducing emissions, um, increasing economic activity, those are more important. Whoops, okay, this is in the wrong. There we go. Um, when I was a kid, when I was born, uh, most kids um, walked their bike to school. Now most are dropped off at school. So these are the types of things we have to think about reversing. How do we change these things? Um, because the average 15 uh, year old is 15 pounds heavier now. And the average adult is 24 pounds heavier. So it's having real impacts, particularly fiscal impacts, as well as quality of life impacts on our, on our uh, culture. And when we look at the data, we realize, wow, 60% um, of the trips are less than six miles. That's not that far, right? Do we really need all of those trips to be car trips? Um, about 30, 40% of those trips are less than a mile taken by car. So what if it was safe out there to walk or bike or take an electric bike, or we had a shuttle, or a really reliable bus that came every five or 10 minutes. And we know now from economic studies that when you build great places that people want to be, they go there and they spend money. They might buy a condo, they might raise kids there. Um, you know, people that are walking, biking, they spend less every time they, they go into a store, but they go in a store two or three times as much because um, they're always going by that store. And, and there's an old saying, the slower somebody's moving, the better chance they're gonna stop in your store. So one thing that's happened in um, cities with bike share is people are realizing, like, wait a second, like, why do I go to the gym? You know, when I was in Amsterdam, Copenhagen, I never saw a gym the whole time I was there. By the way, everybody looks amazing. Part of it's by their, their genes, and they're all like a foot taller than me. But, um, but they just look great, because they bike everywhere all the time. There's like 800 million trips by bike, I think, uh, in Amsterdam last year. But us, you know, this, this is how we walk our dog. But in this person's defense, they probably don't feel safe. There's no sidewalk. 
I mean, if I were that, I'd be worried about the safety of the dog, personally, like if another car comes in the other direction. Um, but, you know, this is, this is our culture. You know, we, we, we get a babysitter, we, we uh, go to the mall, we take the escalator up, escalator down, uh, and we use the treadmill, right? So, that's, those are some of the cultural issues that we have to overcome. So, in terms of, like, from the government standpoint, how do we make uh, change? How do we do it maybe more quickly? Um, there's some great examples, not just in big cities, but small cities, um, uh, towns, where they're trying things like, what if we, instead of telling people about what a bike lane network looks like, what, what if we just built it? And we built it with temporary materials. So for less than $7 million, we built an entire citywide uh, cycle track network. And then they collected all the data and showed the impacts. And you know what? It was super controversial. And they went to city council and they said, here's all the great things. And people came and testified. It almost didn't pass, but it did. And now it's permanent. And so there's this whole idea of, like, for the long-term plan, if you want it to be successful, start showing people with short-term tactical projects what the impacts can be. Um, that's actually a picture of our project in Chicago that I showed you. Um, and it doesn't just have to be a plaza or a bike lane. Um, Although it can be, um, and this sort of shows the before and after of that one. Um, it can be safety projects uh, near schools. Um, it can be bus lanes. It can be a whole transit network with cones, at least on an arterial, but it could be citywide. Um, you can try things and show people how the quality of service changes, and then let them vote uh, either with their tax dollars through a referendum, if you can do that, or politically, to put pressure on the powers that be to invest in different things. And also, there's nothing wrong with experimenting, just because we've always done things one way. This is a story I wrote before, it was about being more creative in terms of sharing lanes. Maybe we need HOV three plus lanes on arterials. Maybe we need to share bus lanes with cyclists. I mean, there's a lot of new things that we could try um, that could take our existing roadways perhaps make them more efficient and make them uh, safer. And the individual is important too. So, you know, there's this fallacy that transit's really expensive, but cars and, and building roads for cars are really cheap. The thing is, if you dig into it, um, walking and biking in infrastructure throw off profit um, because there's so many positive social benefits. And the bus, is six times less subsidized than the car. Okay, so when we build car infrastructure, there's a massive subsidy for it. There's a subsidy for busing too, but it's a lot less. And so how do we use this data uh, to have more collaboration, work faster, and support faster change? So we know that there's a lot of pressure to change, to compete with other jurisdictions. Right? Uh, to build your, your population. Um, there's new companies coming in with new services like Uber. Um, so one of the messages as a, as a capitalist that I like to, to bring to people is all spending is not the same. Right? There's stimulus spending, like the expansion of a lot of our highways, um, which does not really have good benefits uh, in just about any way. It also kills the value of the real estate around it. Um, and there's investing for your future, where it pays dividends over the long term. Um, the other thing is we spend so little of our GDP. We spend um, 2 to 3 percent of gross uh, domestic product on infrastructure and transportation. Europe spends 5 to 6 percent. Asia spends 8 to 9 percent. So that means that the little tiny bit of we, that, that we spend, we need to be very careful how we spend it. And as I was saying, I'm not going to go into this, but this idea of induced demand is important to understand because the data and the science show that uh, building those lanes actually hurts us and makes it, uh, our roads more congested. I already showed that one. Um, so what is the true social cost benefit of the projects? If we're going to look more responsibly fiscally at our investments, so we have to look at the internal versus external costs. 
and we typical we typically look at like basic internal fixed costs, right, and internal variable costs. It costs as much to operate the bus, costs as much to buy the bus. But we're not looking at all the external costs. And the external costs, if you add them all up, because each one is smaller, so you don't pay as much attention to it, they can be more than a lot of the internal costs, right? The cost of congestion, the cost of pollution, the decrease in land value, right? The uh, uh, pain we cause to our water system. But these are all important. And you need to look at them over a 30 year period, just like 2045, which is like 25 years. And so we've, we've been working in this space for a while, trying to rank social utility. I'm not going to bore you with all this, but assigning values um, to different attributes of each transportation mode. And then what we've been able to do in places like Miami is to show what the actual return on investment is. How many projects do you see the government put forth and say, this is the ROI of this project, this is the value that you, the taxpayer, are going to get out of this project? Not only do we not do that, but we don't look at all the external costs. So when you look at economy, environment, equity, fiscal return, happiness, health, and safety, guess what? Something like a bus rapid transit line, 27 times return. Whereas that extra lane on the highway, probably negative 10x. There's a difference, right? So we should demand that our government show us this type of analysis. Um, and then, once you have that type of framework, then you can start doing scenario planning, saying, well, what if we did this versus that? What if, in addition to the bus rapid transit, we also put in a bike network at the same nodes as the bus rapid transit? And what we found is sometimes you get three to four to five X returns. And some of this probably sounds like gobbledygook, but what we're talking about is being able to give the taxpayer a lot better long-term investment return. And that's important. Um, I'm almost out of time, but I do want to talk about parking real quick because I know that we spend a lot of money on parking. Uh, in, in Washington, where I live, we're spending almost $100,000 of space, actually over $100,000 in some places on the waterfront because we're building some underground parking spaces. People don't realize how much parking costs. It's really expensive. We could be housing people. So the average two bedroom, these are like 2012 numbers uh, across the U.S. in 2012 was $800 a month. I, I need to update these, uh, these numbers. You put underground parking space in, that's a $1,300 a month rental instead of $800, right? That's a 62.5% increase to the cost of living versus investing in a bus that runs by every five minutes. So, meanwhile, we've got half a million people that are homeless. Who's heard of migrants? Anybody ever heard of migrants? There's this trend in cities. Uh, part of it's due to these college students with hundred thousand dollars in debt, but part of it's people wanting to live near things more than wanting to have a lot of space. Um, and so the average parking space is three hundred and thirty square feet. The average micro unit is three hundred and thirty square feet. So just imagine if we took some of our parking garages and parking spaces and we converted them into housing, actually three hundred and twenty five square feet. At current interest rates, people could own their own micro unit homes. People come out of school, for instance, for $358 a month, or low income people, right? Who we give affordable housing rentals. So, to some of you, this probably sounds nuts, but what I'm saying is, why are you prioritizing school cars over people? Right? And these are some of the, again, secondary, tertiary impacts of the investments that we make up front in our transportation and our land use system. So when we build that sprawl, there's a lot of costs. You gotta run the electrical out there, right? Flint, Michigan, closing half the cities that can't afford to run the utilities. It's not efficient, it's not fiscally responsible. And personally, as a fiscal conservative, I embrace high return investments. I don't care how much it costs, as long as there's a high return. Because people ask me all the time, well, how much is too much to spend on a bus system? Or, uh, tram system, and I say, I don't care how much it costs. And they say, well, that's completely irresponsible. And I said, no, let's measure the ROI. Um, and let's see what the impact is. And then once we measure the ROI, let's look at the fully loaded social cost benefit over 30 years. Phoenix, not exactly a liberal place, sort of a, uh, a purple place, 
Um, they made the initial investment in a light rail line from the airport. And um, it was very controversial. <laughs> they did a great job with it. And they have seen incredible investments to the point where people voted to tax themselves to the tune of actually $31.2 billion to build out a citywide network. Why? Because the ROI is like $150 billion. So who cares if it costs $30 billion? If you're going to see that kind of return, um, and now they're seeing even more development and more investment, right? So um, there's real impacts from investing versus spending. You know, I could keep going, but I feel like that's sort of a strong point to end on, unless you want me to keep going through. Yeah, go. Okay. Okay. So let's talk real quick about some of the cool shiny objects. And I, I'm into technology. I also do venture capital. Very excited about autonomous vehicles. These are all the trends that are coming right now are happening. Shared electric, autonomous, active scooters, bikes. Um, Co-creation between government and, um, uh, uh, and uh, private sector. And then big data. Um, there's a lot of other things happening in the background um, that are going to change the way people move. Uh, change the cost of it, change our cost of living, um, the fact that we will be living off of you know, ener uh, energy produced by the sun and wind instead of oil is going to be a big thing. You guys are doing a great job of that here, actually. Um, everything is going to electric. The car companies have already built this into their plants and, and they're building them into their factories, as well as buses and bikes and so on and so forth. Um, something that's both sort of good and bad is uh, we've been really fixated on getting stuff brought to us. It can be more efficient, um, but there are also other impacts. Uh, as we know, a lot of downtowns have been hit hard by this, um, and so it's be really important to be competitive for stores to be doing something unique, experiential, versus just selling the same stuff that's on Amazon. Um, we're seeing a lot of investment uh, in autonomous vehicles. I happen to think this is really interesting. Instead of focusing on moving people around, bringing people stuff in uh, very small format vehicles that can um, uh, ride on the, on the regular road network. Um, with autonomy, we're not there yet. We're not there yet, I can tell you. I have a Tesla and it's, the autonomy is terrible. It's not really autonomy. It's really advanced cruise control. But we are getting there. We are getting there. And, and the technology is getting better and better and better faster. But it's not going to solve all of our quality of life and maintenance. It's just another technology, another mode. There's a lot of things that are coming that look a lot like things that came before. Basically, there's nothing new. Um, how many people have taken Uber or Lyft? Uber and Lyft have spent the last 10 years saying they're nothing like the taxi. We were invested in Uber and Lyft. Well, let me tell you something. They're starting to put color schemes on their cars, they're putting advertising on top, and they're, um, and they're making adjustments to their algorithms so, so the drivers can can decide if they pick up fares or not. It's a taxi. <laughs> it's become a taxi. So same with scooters. We, we had scooters 100 years ago. We have scooters again. And so you know what we're seeing is this movement towards access. People want access to things. They don't necessarily want to own things. It's still a big business, but it's not going to be what it was building cars and everybody buying a car and, and driving around and building concrete for, for roads. In my book, Startup City, I, I try to map out a, a responsible future where we use the technology appropriately, but we don't say, we're just gonna use a robot taxi all the time for everything. Because it doesn't solve our problem. It doesn't solve our environmental problem, our quality of life problem, our construction problem. It just pushes it further down the road. So we still need transit. We still need livable, walkable, transit-oriented you know, places. And we need rural places, too. So. The thing we have to admit, this is in Los Angeles. Feel lucky you don't live there. <clears throat> this doesn't work. Um, you know, you can build more and more and more and more lanes, and you'll have the same problem, but it'll just be worse. So we have to admit that it's bad, bad, and bad. Really bad economically, also. Um, there's so many technological trends, and I'm not even going to talk about any of them. But what I will say is, they're both very exciting and, in some sense, uninteresting. They're not going to solve our basic problem. 
So the autonomous vehicle, as much as I love it because of safety, and I want people to get out of driving vehicles, I want my kids to be able to walk to school and not be worried about getting hit by a car, this is just what one means to the cities and towns and regions that we want. We really need public and private to work together to be more socially conscious and fiscally responsible. And when they are, this is um, the private sector uh, and public sector team together and built Clyde Warren Park over a freeway in Dallas, one of the most polluted, nasty places in Dallas. Nobody wanted to live there. But when they turned it into that, it became the most valuable real estate in Dallas. Everybody wanted to live there. That tells you something, right? Public and private work together, and that costs $100 million. It's not that much when you look at the impact on the real estate values. And if you think like change is not going to happen that quickly, it's, it's happening quickly. This is from the Industrial Revolution, not the uh, information age. But this is 1900. There's only one car. It's all horse and buggy. And in 1913, it's all cars. There's no horses. So that's how fast things will change. And uh, we want your region to be competitive. And it's going to be tough. You guys have already gone through a number of transitions over the years that have been tough. Um, people are probably going to work less, right? They're probably going to work from home more. There will probably be fewer factories. There's going to be more 3D printing. Um, the world's going to change. And so what are the things that are going to future-proof your community, make it a place that when, if people work in 20 hours a week, maybe making a lot more per hour, maybe working out of, out of the house, spending more time in, in, in their community, bartering for food with their neighbors, things will be different. Um, are they going to want to live in that dark place I had up on the left, or the nice, green, beautiful, walkable place on the right? What we do know is there's going to be a ton of change, right? And this is the Kubler-Ross model for change management. It's basically built around death, death of people that, that we love, or change, death of the things that we take for granted. But once we start to experiment and make better decisions, um, we can create a better life for ourselves. This is a picture of my daughter, she the first pair of shoes that we got her. Um, but when you look at the United States, we are the richest country in the world. But we're 18th happiest according to the happiness index. So GDP, number one. GDP, social support, health and life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, perception of corruption, everything else, we're not so hot. So we can do better. And when you think about transportation or mobility, as we are now calling it, or connectivity, is it a privilege or a right? Do people have to have a lot of money to have good transportation, or should it be something that everybody has access to? There's a new movement towards universal basic mobility. Google that. It's really interesting. And so we've been talking a lot, working in Los Angeles, for instance, on transportation happiness. This idea that we should look at the quality of the trip, not just how fast we get people there. Do you get some exercise on the trip? Do you get to read a book? Do you get to do some work? Right? Do you enjoy your trip? Transportation should be fun. And by the way, not everybody wants to live in a big city. In fact, you look at the, happy, the happiest places in the US, almost none of them are big cities. They're places like this, but they have very livable, walkable, high quality of life environments. Charlottesville, number three, my hometown. And the good news and the bad news is we have to do this. We don't have a choice. The stuff that I'm talking about is not optional. Yes, it would be much better for our pocketbooks. Yes, we'd be happier. All those things. But if we don't, our kids aren't going to have a place to live. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Learned a lot there. Number one, I need to buy a 1965 Corvette. Number two, I don't want to buy a Camry in Copenhagen. Got that. Number three, I'm going to open a gym in Amsterdam. Because it sounds like I need one. And uh, Brian, you need to find a new way to walk your dog from your car. But, but most important, this idea of, of don't be scared of taking small bets and experimenting and you know, finding the right way forward through learning and really investing in our future. So thank you so much, Gabe, for joining us today. 
Um, and thanks everyone. Uh, really want to get started here in, in testing some questions this evening. Um, as I mentioned before, we've done a lot of learning, we've done a lot of communicating, but we really want to learn a lot too from you this evening. Our purpose, we want to take another step here. We want to share some of your experience through a few survey questions. We're actually going to do that in a, in a kind of a somewhat smart way. We're going to use um, some smart tech, but we've also got a, a less smart way to do that as well, in case you'd rather do it that way. We want to talk a little bit about our mission statement and our vision statement, some statements that are really guiding Ryan and his team's work forward that are really important for us uh, as, we, as we test this. We want to get you some reactions from you. Those are those guiding lights that sit on top of this work. They're supported by goals, objectives, and actions, but we've got to get this general consensus thing right first. So we want to start with that statement. And before we get started on this tonight, I did want to do some quick uh, housekeeping. So in the center of your table, Underneath that big sheet, there's going to be actually a smaller uh, set of sheets that looks just like this. So I'd love if everybody could grab that. It's right there in the center, man, one or two. Yes, you guys might have it out already. So this is going to be an accompaniment to the activity we're about to run through. So in order to run that activity, um, if you'd like, I'd like everyone also to go ahead and grab their, their smartphone if they brought it with them here this evening. Don't, remember, don't forget about our blue shirts that are out there, just like at Best Buy, to help you out. We want to do some quantitative testing, we want to get some data, but we also want to get some qualitative feedback, and this is going to help you do that, and so is your phone. So, I want to give some instructions here. We're also going to need a pencil, everyone should have one of those, or a pen in front of you to be able to do our activity this evening. We've got a general comment card, I'll talk about that stuff later. So if you've got your smartphone out, uh, if you're connected to Wi-Fi, that's great, you don't have to be to run the exercise, but you see some some instructions are at the center of the table. The first thing I'd like for you everyone to do is open up a browser, so Safari or Chrome or whatever you might have on your phone. You're going to open up that browser. And I'd like for you to type in www.menti.com into the address bar. Don't worry, I'm going to blow this up. It's menti.com, and you're also going to see these directions right on your survey and vision worksheet. Get that typed in. And when you get to the first prompt, and I'm going to, I'm going to go over this again, you're going to type in a code. It's 58, it's 580925. Okay. Okay, so as you start to get connected, if you get to that first screen, what I want you to do is just go ahead and raise, either raise your hand up or just flash us. If you're having some troubles connecting, we got some folks all around the room to help you get in. Remember, you don't have to use a smartphone, but it might be a little bit more fun. So once you see this screen in your browser, you're going to go to 580925. All right, that's menti.com. Okay. All right, is anyone having some trouble? If you're having trouble, go ahead and raise your hand up. We'll get you fixed. Code is 580925. And I already see people participating here. Our first question 580925. Okay, remember, if you're having any trouble connecting, you can also use your worksheet here tonight. Now, your worksheet's also going to be important as we run through these questions because you may have some qualifying statements or some questions about the question or some ideas about what might be missing from this or how you'd like to elaborate. As you go through this exercise, I'd love if you jot some of those notes down for me as well. We're going to have a little conversation at the end, so I'd love if you've got some of that feedback for us as we go. If you are participating just on your form, if you wouldn't mind just noting that on the top, because your data is going to become part of all this data as well, just let us know that's how you're participating tonight. Okay, you're already in there. You guys are very tech savvy. You must have really listened to Gabe. So, does pineapple belong on a pizza? If you've pulled up your phone, you are already <laughs> interacting with us. We've got, it looks like pineapple is currently winning. This is interesting. 2.6. We're up to 47. So I'm going to give it just a second. So if you're participating, we're going to see where we can hit that high point. So as everyone votes, you should see that you voted on there. Oh my goodness. You're going to tie? Are you kidding me? 2.5. We've got to get one more vote. We've got to get a clincher here. Okay. I can't believe this. We've, this has never happened. It's a tie. 
So I guess we don't know. I guess we'll get pepperoni. You guys see how it works, right? It's not too challenging. We're gonna run through some questions here. Some of it reacting to the work that Brian's been doing, his team's been doing, some of it a little bit on what Gabe just presented. But we wanna get some reactions to the work that we've been doing here and help move this forward. So, got about 54 people participating. For those of you that aren't, and you're just using the form, that's great too. And just remember to follow along with us and input your stuff as we go along. Okay, so the first thing we wanna talk about as we dive into this is a little bit about your community. Don't feel like you gotta to squint too hard. Remember, this is gonna come up on your phone as well, or it's written right on your sheet as well. Okay, let's talk about your community. Let's how, talk about how you get where you're going. So, I wanna know first, what type of community do you live in today? Is it mostly suburban? Is it mostly urban? Is it mostly rural? Is it one of those rural subdivisions? Is it a small town that you've got a lot of in, in your region? Or is it some other type of place that I didn't, I didn't talk about here? So remember our high point was around just over 50, so we're gonna let that start to aggregate. Got a lot of small town folks, got a few urban folks. So just like your region, we've got a diverse group here tonight in terms of where you're coming from. As a quick reminder and aside, if you didn't participate in our live work map, we'd love for you to do that before you leave here tonight. Let us know where you're coming from or where you go each morning or evening for work. All right, we're coming up the ladder here. We're over 50. Looks like the city folks are winning, but only by one over the small towns. We've got a diverse group. I'm going to move quickly through these, but remember, if you've not voted, you're still making up your mind, you can still do that and submit that and become part of our data, okay? So let's see. we got one more rural in there. We've got a big, diverse crowd here tonight. That's great. So second question I'd like to ask, does the area around your house have sidewalks? Does the area around your house have sidewalks? These guys, as you, as you recall, we're not just planning for certain types of infrastructure. We're thinking about the whole thing, trying to understand what the system looks like today in terms of what's there and what's, and what's not. Is it great votes? Yes, but they're not complete. No. So this completion question has been really important to us about trying to close the gap on some of this network. We're hitting the 54, so I'm gonna move on but a healthy mix there as well in terms of the sidewalk coverage in all these communities around us. And some of us might live in a rural context where sidewalks are not as relevant. Another question, number three, how often do you walk or bike? How often do you walk or bike? Whether it's for fun, whether it's for transportation. Is it never? Do you do it for exercise? Do you do it rarely? If so, often, you know, once a week, pretty often. More than three times, very often. See Ben back there? Be, I think he's clicking very often. <laughs> or I only walk for that matter. Let us know. All right. Pretty good mix here. Healthy crew. All right. You guys see how this is working, right? So a few questions, variety of types of questions we're trying to ask. Aside from, from weather, what would encourage you to walk aside from weather? I love that. Because when you ask this in Miami, it's not that hard to jump on a bike. It feels great. It might be hot. But aside from weather, because this is uh, the Midwest, uh, we just live down the road from you. Our weather is the same. Um, what would encourage you to walk more? So is it the sidewalk, road infrastructure? Is it expanded trail network? You guys see this is a ranked choice order. So we're trying to see which of these would be number one to help you think about maybe walking more around your community. Is it that expanded trail network? Is it maybe increased pedestrian safety measures? Is it about beautification of our roadways, just feeling more aesthetically as you walk, walk in and around your places? Or what was the one I missed? Or is it the infrastructure improvement itself, the basic underfoot infrastructure that's so important? Good feedback rolling in. So that trail network seems important. And that's definitely something that we've heard a lot about. One of those great assets that's really burgeoning in and around this region is the notion of some of your multi-use trails. Um, now, not just in your region, but in the surrounding areas as well. Obviously, Indy really has been leading the country on that. So great feedback coming in here. I'm going to advance in the, in the spirit of time, but 
but looks like sidewalk and road infrastructure is quite important to this question about what would encourage you to walk a little bit more. What about on the transit side? So when we think about transit, whether it's a bus or some other means, if you think about ranking these orders, what would encourage you to think about transit or even to take transit more? Is it about the frequency of the buses? Is it about maybe a closer bus stop to where you would get on or where you might get off? Is it about those route destinations that, that are out there uh, that we have today or we could have? Is it about extended service hours? Is it about consistent routes or stops? Uh, or is it about a better understanding of just the system that, that already exists here today? So tell us, what, how would you rank these things when we think about transit? Trans has been obviously a big part of our conversation, a part of the data that, that Ryan's been working on through this work. The challenge we face in this is, this, as Ryan would be the first to admit, this is a very large region, right? So this frequency and coverage question is really, really important to us. Good feedback coming in. I don't know if you guys like getting bragged on or not, but when we did this in Lepore, it took them a whole lot longer to figure this out, so you should count yourselves very quick. Not to pick on Lepore. All right. Doing great. Doing great. Remember, if you're still contemplating, you're still ranking, you can still do that, but I am going to move on. So, big question here. How do you get to work or school every day? And remember, this is the dominant way. You may be multimodal in some way, but it's the dominant way you get to work every day. Do you work at home? Are you lucky enough to work at home? Are you retired? Are you even luckier to be retired? Do you drive alone? Do you carpool? Do you take the bus? Bike or walk? Taxi or, or ride hailing app, even though Lyft doesn't want to be a taxi really? Or is some other means? Great quick votes coming in here. Saw a lot of clustering around driving. Some lucky folks working at home and some retired. How about how long your daily commute is? So tell us about the length of that. When you, when you go to or from work, one way, remember one way, how long does it take you? Is it more than 45 minutes? That's quite a, quite a hike. All the way down to, again, I'm lucky enough to work at home. So we're learning more about your commuting patterns as we're doing this work. Where you go each morning is really, really important for this question. And that first blue bar about working from home or telecommuting is a big part of this, you know, understanding that moving forward, like the tax that, how we tax our infrastructure. All right, great feedback there. Now let's talk a little bit about our region. So we talked there about our community, about your experience, about your mobility. Let's talk about our region. Are you concerned about the loss of natural and or agricultural lands to growth and development. Now, this is one of those spectrum questions, right? So you can tell me, yeah, well, I'm a little concerned toward the left, or I'm not concerned at all. You know, that's the price of progress. Or on the other side, yeah, I'm extremely concerned about this particular question. This notion about the loss of natural or and or agricultural lands to growth and development. Remember, this is thinking about our region. So that big map back there, our, our region. Good feedback coming through here. All right. Remember, I'm not going to kick you out. Let's rank something here when we talk about quality of place. When we talk about the places you like to be in your community. What makes a strong quality of place in this region? Is it about the shopping and entertainment? Is it about arts, culture, history? Is it about the community events, the programming, the activities, the vibrancy of the place? Is it about the natural spaces or green spaces that we have here in such abundance? Neighborhood-centric businesses, those nodes, those centers. Um, and remember, if it's something else, you've got your sheet. Jot that down. Let us know if there's something missing. How do we mix these things to create great places in the future? Those events are important. The green spaces are important. You 
remember as Ryan introduced the region, uh, the state of the region talked a lot about that connection between land use and transportation and why it's so important. These questions help us think a little bit about that, the types of places that are in the region today and the ones maybe that could be in the future. Doing really well here, doing really well. Let's talk about investments. Um, not just spending, but investments, as Gabe points out. Investing in our region. Number, number 10, if you're following along in your sheet, what types of initiatives would you support to reduce emissions? So we go from incentivizing electric vehicles, incentivizing transit, or the notion of building more trails or sidewalks to transition public to, uh, to a vehicle fleet to, to electric vehicles, or is it something else? I'd like for you to pick one, yeah. But if you've got something you feel strongly about, I really want you to use your sheet. Because remember, I'm going to be collecting that too. Or if this is not important to you, I want you to tell me on that sheet as well. Great feedback coming in here as well. Okay, this is a this is a little bit of a trickier question, but. I want you to think about the $100 million that we've got to spend, 113 to be exact. We think about how we can invest that really strategically into our region. With $100 million, how would you invest in our transportation system? Now what you get to do with this one is you can click in $10 increments, or 10 million, wow, $10 million increments, uh, and up that for each of these initiatives, right? It says a percentage, but think of that as a dollar sign. So as you look through this list, I would like you to allocate that hundred million across the list. We got folks already jumping in here. Transit improvements, safety improvements, bicycle or pedestrian infrastructure, trails, sidewalks, bike lanes, roadway expansion, new roads or additional lanes, operational improvements, so signal coordination, and other means. Seems like a lot of money. I think it would go pretty quickly, right? One of the things that Ryan and his team are, are tasked with doing in this work is developing you know, two versions of this work, right? One that is quite fiscally contained and one that's that perhaps more visionary, right? So what we're thinking about here is within this, this fiscally contained thing, where do we prioritize our projects and our investments? Bicycle pedestrian infrastructure, quite important, as with transit. Got great answers here. I'm gonna let those folks who are still working mull this over. So let's talk now a little bit about this region's overall direction. Directions to think about mobility. There's a couple of big statements that we've had to develop through this work. As you, any of you who've done strategic planning or even community planning, you're quite familiar with this conversation. But it, but it's quite necessary because it establishes for us and the S I'm referring to is your region, our common starting point, right? What we're aiming for and how we intend to get there. This mission is important because it says how we're going to achieve something broader, which is really about the vision. We've worked with those folks in the stakeholder committee who raised their hands earlier, who we'll make sure to thank in earnest later on, to develop some test statements that we'd like to get some reactions from you today. Remember when we talk about the mission here, and this is the mission of the plan, the mission of our organization moving forward, this approach to how we're going to reach the vision, goals, and objectives. And this is the statement. We aspire to create a complete transportation system that puts people first. This is how we intend to get there. What I want to do, and that statement is written for you on page four of your handout. What I would like for you to do, and I'd like you to tell me, when you hear that statement, as you think about everything that we need to do as a group, do you completely support that statement? Is that a five? Or do you have no support for that statement? Now, thinking about that, if you're anything below a five, I would love to know in writing maybe what's off. What doesn't feel right? What could be added? What's missing right now? What could be modified? But let me know how we're doing. This is about that testing piece. Again, this is how we operate as we move forward, trying, 
trying hard to improve our community year on year. We aspire to create a complete transportation system that puts people first. Great feedback coming in. It's like you're overall, you're okay with it. That's, that's great. That's really good to hear, right? Um, the other side of this that's, that's quite important is what are we aiming for? What are we aiming to achieve? Our vision statement has is, is been the process of, well, it's been a long process of, communicate, of conversations with you all and we've tried our best to encompass a lot of thoughts and as few words as possible, which is, as you know, quite hard to do. But I want to reveal that statement. I want to get some feedback from, from the team here uh, in the room. But remember that this is our desired future, right? This is our desired future state. It's the broadest expression of all of our aspirations. And we're thinking here about our mobility. We're thinking about our transportation network. Our vision, through 2045 in motion, we aim to realize a transportation system that is efficient, effective, and equitable. Now we dive into those statements, and we define efficient as emphasizing strategic investments that enhance existing assets and strengthen community connectivity. We define effective, seamlessly integrating multiple modes of transport and embracing innovation to safely connect our communities locally and regionally. And we define equitable, ensuring all, reason, region, res, ensuring all residents have access to the growing opportunities of the broader region. I'm going to open this up. Remember, you've got this also written in front of you on page four. But we see that statement being supported by those principles, those pillars. A lot of ease. Effective, efficient. Tell us how you feel. If you're not a five, tell us why. So as Brian develops his project list and his team develops policies that are going to support that, and what's what's missing from that statement today that you would like to see? And I'm going to leave this one open as we transition to our next activity. But remember, you can always reflect back, and this one's going to stay open. So as your as your group, as you individually come up with ideas. Add them to this list or make sure that you jot those down in the work to go. How we pay for it? That's the prime question, isn't it? Right? A lot of great stuff coming out here. Revolutionary, partnerships, safe. Mobility should be in the statement. That's maybe a good catch, right? That's going to be our core word, right? Great stuff. So I'm going to leave this open and I'm going to leave this active. So remember, you can continue to add as we go. But you no doubt through Gabe's comments, through Ryan's comments, likely not from mine, but from the team overall, have some things and some ideas that have come up through uh, through this reaction. What I'd love to do is, with the brief time we have left, the tables that you've all formed naturally, to have a quick conversation about some of your strongest reactions from, from tonight. So for those of you that are feeling an itch to kind of be the Napoleon of that table, I would love if there's a team leader that could self-nominate, that maybe, and I say team leader, I mean someone that can help write down the conversation you're all about to have. At the center of your table, and maybe one of our helpers could help me out, we've got a large piece of paper. Somebody grab that for me. Lisa's got it. Can you see the center? There you go. Big piece of paper. That's going to be the group recorder form. So if you grab that just now, guess what? You're the table leader. Okay? How's that, how's that work? Guys, if you're part of a smaller group, if you're part of a smaller group, feel free to join a bigger one. But table leaders, why don't you go ahead and raise your hand real quick. Got table leaders, table leaders, table one and two. You guys may want to merge if you want to. Table leaders, all right. Well, thank them for, uh, for their poor hand here. 
But guys, with the time we have left, what I'd love to ask is, with everything you've heard tonight, and you've heard a lot, I'd love to know what some of your strongest reactions are to the program. You may have written those down. They may be part of your vision. But table leaders, as, as best you can, and I want you to participate as well, let's try to collect as many of those thoughts as we can. If you've got some specific questions for us, we're going to roam around as well. But take some time, reflect on the program, and let us know what might be missing, what we can be looking into further, or what some of your strongest reactions to the work we've done so far. Table leaders, they are all yours.
So if you're still talking, that's great. I don't want to cut anyone off. But I did want to give our co-chairs one chance here to thank you for being here, thank our stakeholder committee, and point a little bit of the direction forward. We've got a few next steps. Um, if you've not filled out your exit questionnaire, that's that yellow piece of paper, please do that before you leave so that we know who joined us here um, today and was not part of our conversation. If you've got a comment card you want to fill out, make sure you get that to one of our team members. And last but not least, if you know someone who wasn't at the meeting tonight but you think we really dig this conversation, has a lot to say, make sure you share this website with them because they can do all these activities right there on the web as well. But before we leave, I wanted to introduce and thank personally our co-chairs for this effort for the 2045 in motion effort, Lisa Floyd, Sherry Peak Davis. They have been instrumental in guiding our committee through what is a very, very complicated process. We've gone through a lot of acronyms together, but Lisa, Sherry, thank you so much for being here, and would you like to close out and thank everyone for being here as well. Thank you, Kyle. I want to say thanks to everyone who took time out of their busy schedule to join us tonight, and a special thanks for your participation and your input. There's a whole lot of conversations still going on, and that's a great thing, and as Kyle said, don't let the conversation end here tonight. Go online, um, send your friends and your colleagues, and, and keep participating in this conversation. Thank you to Gabe Klein for leading his, lending his perspective to this important uh, conversation for our communities. Thank you to the MCOG staff, the interns, and the consultants who initiated and continue to lead this thought and planning process. Thank you to the committee members for their time and their interest in this journey. We're all very excited to be leading such an important process, and we're encouraged by all of your support and your ideas that you're giving back to us, and it is a journey. It's been a journey. Um, so our next steps, 
We're going to be integrating um, all of your perspective and priorities into a model for regional growth and development. We will be developing an action agenda in pursuit of our communities. And I like to use the word communities as plural because, again, I want to um, encourage from all aspects of Madison County, and we have Fortville and Daleville and Chesterfield, we really need all of the communities input in this and the vision for mobility. And we will launch the implementation of the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and begin to transform our region. We've had a wonderful time here sharing today learning more about what transportation in the future could look like, but the conversation is still ongoing. So we encourage you to stay connected with the 2045 in motion and pull your friends into the discussion. And as we continue to move forward, look for more updates soon. And thank you all for coming and have a wonderful evening. Thank you and thank you all for being here.